we now learn about inverse functions. Indeed, we'll learn what an inverse function is, and starting from a function f of x, we'll learn how to find an expression for its inverse function. We'll then learn how to draw a function's inverse function, starting from its graph. And finally, we'll learn about the domain and range of a function's inverse function. So, we have quite a bit to cover, so let's get started. In the upper left-hand corner here, we can see that I've drawn a mapping diagram. And that's the mapping diagram for this function here. That's f of x, which equals to 2x plus 6. Just as for many mapping diagrams, we have this box here, which represents the input values for the function. And we have this second box here, which represents the corresponding output values. In other words, if I were to replace x inside f of x by negative 5, then I'd obtain the output value negative 4. Or if I were to replace x by the input value negative 3, then we'd obtain the output value 0. And so for each of these input values, we'd obtain the corresponding output value we see in the second box. Now, this function's inverse function is a function which maps each of these output values back onto its corresponding input value. In other words, this function's inverse function is such that if we were to replace x by negative 4, then it should give us an output value equal to negative 5. Similarly, for the input value 0, the inverse function should give us the output value negative 3. And something similar could be said for each of the values we have inside this box. In other words, the inverse function maps each of the outputs of f of x back onto its original input value. And I can summarize that at the bottom of this mapping diagram here with this arrow. This function's inverse function, which we refer to with an f and an exponent of negative 1, takes the output values of f of x as its input values to then give us its output values, which are the input values of f of x. And so how do we find this inverse function? Well, first of all, let me start by pointing out something we don't do. Although we write the inverse function like this, an f with an exponent of negative 1 over x, this is not equal to 1 over f of x. Indeed, when looking at this notation, some of you may be thinking of the power of negative 1, as we typically come across in algebra. For instance, a to the power of negative 1, which equals to 1 over a. But that's not what we're dealing here. This exponent of negative 1 is only there to indicate that we're dealing with the inverse function, and it does not work in the same way as what I wrote here. So, let's see how to find the expression for an inverse function. Starting from the function we have here, which I'll copy at the top here, that's f of x, which equals to 2x plus 6, we can find this function's inverse function in two steps. The first step, step 1, is to start from the expression y equals to 2x plus 6, and to rearrange this to make x the subject. And for that, the first thing I'll do is get rid of this 6, which is being added to the right-hand side. And I do so by subtracting 6, which I do to both sides of this equation. And that leads us to y minus 6 equals to 2x. Next, on the right-hand side, I can see that x is being multiplied by 2, and so I get rid of that 2 by dividing both sides of this equation by 2, which leads to y minus 6 over 2 equals to x, which I can rewrite as x equals to y minus 6 over 2. And although we don't have to, I like to split this fraction into two separate fractions to write x equals to y over 2 minus 6 over 2. In other words, x equals to y over 2 minus 3. And that's the first step done. We've now rearranged the expression we started off with to make x the subject. And so I move on to the second and final step, step 2, in which I swap the x and the y in the expression I just found, and I define the inverse function. Copying this expression but swapping x and y leads to y equals to x over 2 minus 3. And now replacing y by this notation for the inverse function, we can define this function's inverse function 
that's inverse f of x, which equals to x over 2 minus 3. And that's the answer. We now have an expression for the inverse function. And just to check that this is indeed this function's inverse function, let's go ahead and replace x by one of the output values of f of x. If it is indeed its inverse function, it should lead us back to its corresponding input value. So for instance, if I replace x by 10, this inverse function should give us 2. So let's go ahead. Replacing x by 10, we get inverse of f of 10 equals to 10 over 2 minus 3. Since 10 divided by 2 is 5, that's equal to 5 minus 3, which leads us to inverse of f of 10 equals to 5 minus 3, which is 2, which confirms that we're indeed dealing with this function's inverse function. And the two steps we've just seen can always be followed when looking for the expression of a function's inverse function. And I should say, some teachers, textbooks, or even other videos often swap the x and the y in step one. Once that's done, they then rearrange the expression obtained to make y the subject again. And that does work perfectly well. Nevertheless, I'm going to be sticking to the two steps I've just shown you here, as I find it more useful for more complicated examples like we'll be seeing later on in the course. Okay, now that we know how to do that, let's go ahead and learn how to draw a function's inverse function using its graph. On the right-hand side of the screen here, we have the graph of y equals to f of x. And in fact, I should label that, that's y equals to f of x. And this is the same f of x as the one we worked with here. That was f of x, which equals to 2x plus 6. But without using this function's expression, nor the expression we found for its inverse function, we can use the graph of f of x we have here to draw its inverse function. And for that, all we need are a few rules. The first of which is that a function and its inverse function are the mirror images of each other across the line y equals to x. Now the line y equals to x passes through the origin, so that's the point right here with coordinates 0, 0, and it has a gradient or slope equal to 1. And to draw it, all we need are two points, one of which I've already added here, that's the origin, and as a second point, we can take any point we want, provided it has the same x and y coordinates. So for instance, I could take this point right here with coordinates 5, 5. Now, drawing the line passing through those two points, we obtain the line y equals to x. Okay, so the inverse function we're trying to draw is the mirror image of this blue line across this line y equals to x. And if you're comfortable with that, then you may already have a good idea of what the inverse function looks like. And if not, don't worry, here are two more things to remember to make sure you can sketch the inverse function. If ever the graph of f of x crosses the line y equals to x, like at the point right here, then the inverse function has to cross that line at the same point. And so we can go ahead and state without thinking that the inverse function has to pass through the red point I just added here. And in fact, I could add its coordinates. Those are negative six, negative six. And finally, a fundamental rule to always remember is that if y equals to f of x passes through a point with coordinates a and b, then the inverse function has to pass through the point with coordinates b, a. And this rule will be true for every single point the graph of f of x passes through. And on the graph here, we have two very important points. Those are the x and y intercepts. Indeed, we can see that f of x has an x-intercept at x equals to negative 3. In other words, it crosses the x-axis at negative 3. Now, if we wanted to, we could be more specific and state that that point has coordinates negative 3, 0. And so using the rule we stated above here, this tells us that the inverse function has to pass through the point with coordinates 0, negative 3, which would be right here on the y-axis. And in fact, I'll label that, that's negative 3 on the y-axis. 
Similarly, we can see that f of x crosses the y-axis at 6. And once more, we could be more specific and state that that point has coordinates 0, 6. And so this rule tells us that the inverse function has to pass through the point with coordinates 6, 0, which would be right here on the x-axis. And so I'll label that that 6 on the x-axis. And what we quickly realize here is that from a function to its inverse function, the x and y intercepts are swapped. And so using that, as well as the fact that the inverse function is the mirror image of f of x across y equals to x, and the fact that it has to pass through this point here, we can draw the inverse function. And it would look something like this. There we go. Of course, with a ruler, this would look far better. But we've just sketched the graph of this function's inverse function. And the good news is the rules we've just seen here to draw this function's inverse function will always be true, so do make a note of them. Okay, at this stage we have a good idea of what a function's inverse function is and does, we know how to find its expression, and we know how to draw it using the graph of f of x. But what about its domain and range? Well, let me go back to this mapping diagram for a second. The fact that the inverse function maps each of the output values of f of x back onto its input values tells us all we need to know about the domain and the range of a function's inverse function. And that is that the domain, domain of inverse f of x equals to the range of f of x and that the range of inverse f of x is equal to the domain of f of x. And this is a very important result, and it's often used in exam questions, so do make a note of it. Indeed, provided we know or can find the domain and range of a given function, then thanks to this rule, we can state the domain and range of its inverse function. In fact, here's an example. Let's say we were given the function f of x, which equals to the square root of x minus 4 plus 1. And we were told that its domain is equal to all real numbers from 4 included up to positive infinity, and its range is equal to all real numbers from 1 included up to positive infinity. Alternatively, another and perhaps simpler way of writing this domain would be x is greater than or equal to 4, and for the range we could write y is greater than or equal to 1. Now, let's say we had to state this function's inverse function's domain and range. Well, this function's inverse function would be inverse f of x, and it's equal to x squared minus 2x plus 5. Don't worry, I'll show you how to get this expression before the end of this video. For now, though, I want to focus on this inverse function's domain and range. What this rule allows us to state without even thinking is that its domain is equal to the range of f of x, so its domain is equal to all real numbers from 1 included up to positive infinity, and its range is equal to the domain of the original function f of x, so that's all real numbers from 4 included up to positive infinity. And we could of course write these as domain is x greater than or equal to 1, and range is y greater than or equal to 4. And thanks to this rule, we could simply state the inverse function's domain and range this way without any further justification. Okay, now to finish this video, as I said, let me show you how I found the expression for this function's inverse function. Remember, to do that, I use these two steps. So, step one, I start from the function we have here, which I write as y equals to the square root of x minus 4 plus 1, and I now seek to rearrange this to make x the subject. For that, I'll start by getting rid of this 1 that's being added to the right-hand side, and I do so by subtracting 1 from both sides. So that leads to y minus 1 equals to the square root of x minus 4. Next, because this x is stuck underneath this square root, I need to get rid of it. And the way to get rid of this is by squaring this right-hand side. 
But as always, anything I do on one side of the equation, I have to do on the other. So I square the entire left-hand side as well as the right-hand side. And that leads us to, in parentheses, y minus 1 squared equals to the square root of x minus 4 squared, which is x minus 4. Now, using a perfect square formula, I open up this pair of parentheses, leading us to y squared minus 2y plus 1, and that's equal to x minus 4. And I now get rid of this 4 that's being subtracted from the right-hand side, and I do so by adding 4 to both sides. And so we get y squared minus 2y plus 5 equals to x, which I like to write as x equals to y squared minus 2y plus 5. And that's the first step done. We've just made x the subject. And so I move on to step 2, in which I use the expression we just found, and I swap the x and the y's to define this function's inverse function. So swapping the x and the y's, we get y equals to x squared minus 2x plus 5. And so this function's inverse function is inverse f of x equals to x squared minus 2x plus 5. And there we go. We now have this function's inverse function, whose domain and range are shown here. And in fact, let's quickly sketch this function and its inverse function on the same xy grid. So let's see if I quickly draw an xy grid, something looking like this. There we go. The curve of f of x would be y equals to the square root of x minus 4 plus 1, which has a starting point right here with coordinates 4, 1, and it increases slowly, looking something like this. That's y equals to f of x. And just looking at this curve and its starting point, the fact that its first x-coordinate is 4, and that it carries on infinitely towards the right, confirms that this function's domain is x is greater than or equal to 4. Furthermore, the fact that its lowest point has y-coordinate 1, and that this is an increasing function which goes upwards, confirms the range we have here, all y values greater than or equal to 1. Now for the inverse function, its curve is the mirror image of this blue one across the line y equals to x, which I'll quickly sketch like this. There we go, that's y equals to x, and its starting point will have coordinates 1, 4. Remember, I'm getting that from the rule I wrote at the top here, so I'll say that's right here. That's the point with coordinates 1, 4. And so drawing this blue curve's mirror image across y equals to x, we get something looking like this. There we go. That's y equals to inverse f of x. And looking at this, we can confirm the domain and range we have here. Indeed, the x-coordinate of its starting point is 1, and the curve shoots towards the right, which confirms this x greater than or equal to 1, and its starting point has a y-coordinate of 4, and then shoots upwards infinitely, which confirms this range y greater than or equal to 4. And there we go. Now we still have some more things to learn about inverse functions. For instance, how to show that a given function is another function's inverse function. But for now, we should hopefully have a good idea of what an inverse function is and does, how to find an expression for a function's inverse function, as well as how to draw or sketch a function's inverse function from its graph, and last but not least, we know how to state the domain and range of a function's inverse function. And there we go. That's it for this tutorial.